What's going on, guys? Welcome to the hostile page. This is a new page we set up for the company, and we are going to start with a Q&A. So I want to get you guys up to speed on how things are going. The products have been ordered, and we're looking at about an 8 to 10, eight to ten week lead time. So we're hoping to be launched by January 1st. And for those of you who have been asking, we're starting with a pre-workout, a pump product, an intra-workout, and essential amino acid. I can't really give out the ingredients yet because... We want to make sure we're first to market with our formula. I don't want anybody to copy our formula before we get ours out there. So the ingredient list, we're going to have to keep under wraps for now. Uh, all the flavor testing is done. Everything is done. Everything looks great. I've sampled it. I've given to some other people to sample. And um, all the reviews have been pretty much awesome. Um, I know a lot of people have been messaging me, messaging me and asking me for samples. We don't have proper samples done yet. These were just samples that I kind of put on put in Ziploc baggies and gave, gave to people in person. Uh, when we do have proper samples, though, I will announce that you can order samples and all that thing, all that kind of stuff to try out for yourself. But uh, I do believe the product will be out before the samples are. Now, if you have, if you really want to get your hands on the product, um, sign up for pre-orders. You can do that. Uh, we'll post a link in the description where you guys can click and go there and put your emails in. So you'll be the first to be in line for pre-orders when they go on sale. We're hoping to get pre-order sales up um, in December. That way you guys can order the product about a month before it's ready. Make sure it's shipped to your door as, as soon as it comes out, as soon as it's done. So I'm really happy about that. Everything I'm really excited. The feedback has been really good. Um, and I'm actually just really, really excited for you guys to try it. I think, you know, a lot of people have asked me what is different between your supplements and other supplements that are on the market. Well, I don't, I don't believe in talking poorly about other businesses, so I'm not going to do that. I, I think there's a lot of great supplements out there. I think what we focused on was I wanted to have a clinical dose of each ingredient that we put in the product. And what I mean by that is there are, are doses that are done by like when they do, when they take an ingredient, say they take a, a beta alanine or something like that. They do a study based on uh, an amount that your body can absorb or the, uh, the amount that your body uses. And that, and those studies are where we get our numbers as to what to formulate the product with. So we basically took all of our ingredients and looked at all the studies and, and figured out where are the clinical doses that these studies are using to, to make sure that the user, end user, is getting the most effective dose for their workout. So it's kind of like, if I can explain it a little more simply, it's kind of like if you're ordering, like if you're going to buy orange juice and you buy orange juice from Concentrate, it's going to say there's orange juice in there, but how much orange juice is in there? Okay, so we're, what we're, we're focusing on is if we put uh, citrulline in a product, how much citrulline are you getting? Are you getting three grams? Are you getting two grams? Are you getting six grams? Is it citrulline malate or is it pure citrulline? These type of, types of things really matter to me when I'm buying my supplements. So I'm trying to put that into, I'm trying to move that forward into my own supplements so that when you guys try them, you're like, okay, I know I got the clinical dose for X, Y, Z ingredient. My body doesn't need more and I'm not getting any less. So I'm confident that this is what I need. And this is what the study showed. So you'd think it would be pretty simple that other companies would just do that. But there's different formulations. So people think certain ingredients don't work. And other people think certain ingredients are very important. So there's that aspect of it. And then the other aspect is, you know, without accusing anybody, certain companies want to shave want to make a little bit more margin on their products. So they'll take some ingredients out or put less of an ingredient in their product. And I don't really believe in that. If we're going to have an ingredient in our product, I'm going to make sure it's at the dose that your body can use. So that's when people keep asking me, what's the difference between your supplements and other supplements? That's the main difference I see. If you, if you're getting X ingredient, you're getting the full dose of X ingredient. You're not getting half the dose. You're not getting a quarter dose. You're not getting 
a bunch of proprietary blends. I'd like to do a proprietary blend because I don't want anybody copying our formula, but in the, uh, in trying to be extremely transparent, we're just going to put it out there and let you guys see that this is what it's supposed to look like. And I know you guys are going to like it because I've been sampling it and I'm like, I feel great in the gym. And, um, I'm just positive you guys are going to like it. And I, I, I just think for those people who try it, they're not going to change back to whatever they were using before. I'm pretty sure they're just going to move on with our stuff because they're going to feel the difference. And that's the most important thing. Can you feel the difference? Because, and it depends on what you're feeling. Some people get caught up with, well, it feels tingly and it feels as well. I can put it just a whole bunch of niacin in a product and that'll make you feel tingly and flush. But are you feeling the right thing? Are you feeling the thing you're supposed to feel when you're training? So this is kind of what we focused on and I hope it translates when you guys try out the product. But uh, yeah, so I'm just really excited and everything's kind of going exactly the way uh, we were hoping so far. So far, knock on wood, we haven't had any hurdles or any real uh, obstacles to jump through or jump over. Uh, it's just been kind of moving steadily along and the feedback has been great. So I appreciate you guys, your support and your patience. But we'll be out soon. So anyway, without further ado, uh, I want to get to the Q&A because this was part two of a Q&A and I told you guys I would post this part on, on the hostile page, on the company page. And uh, we'll get into some supplement questions and other questions um, that we've kind of picked out of a whole slew of questions that we had. In the future, uh, if you guys could leave your questions in the comment section below here, I can take the Q&As from... Uh, this actual page and answer them on future videos. All right. So the first one is Stuart Riddle says, do you think Luke could win a Mr. Olympia? Love the podcast. Keep them coming. Um, I do think Luke could win a Mr. Olympia. I think Luke has all the tools to win a Mr. Olympia. I think he has a very complete physique. Uh, definitely has enough muscle. Uh, structure is good. Uh, his waist, ever since he started doing the vacuum, his waist is you know, once he pulls that vacuum on a front double, it's pretty much perfect. It's flawless. It's a flawless shot for him. So I think as long as they can keep nailing his condition, uh, Luke is going to be one to watch for. He's probably going to slowly rise and start dominating the shows. It just, for him, it's going to, Luke is one of those bodybuilders where if you're 2% off, it looks like 20% off. It's not like, you know, other bodybuilders can get away with, Oh, he came in a little off, but he still looks amazing. That's not Luke. And that's not me either. Like certain bodybuilders, they have to be 100% on to look really impressive or else it just kind of, it's not their showing. So yeah, I do believe Luke has potential for that. Uh, Tuzi says, how are your supplements different than others on the market? Kind of already answered that in the beginning of the, of the video. So thanks for the question, but kind of your answers already been, your question's already been answered. Uh, Mr. Ali Amiri says, how do you know how much macros to intake? So over the course of decades of training, a lot of studies have been done and a lot of trial and error has been done. And through the years, it gets passed down and the studies show that, you know, X amount of protein, X amount of carbs, X amount of fat is ideal. And it's what the body needs per day. Now, those numbers can vary from person to person, depending on what kind of diet they're doing. But if you're doing a balanced diet, for example, and, and again, these are just, a, these are opinions because certain studies will show that like one gram of protein per pound of body weight is enough, but then it depends how, what your body fat is. If your body fat's too high, then you're not going to do one gram of body fat, uh, one gram per pound of body weight. You're going to do one gram per pound of lean body mass. If your body fat is normal or lower than you know, it's lower than it's, you know, it's a lower body fat or normal body fat. You know, if you're in the 10 to 15% range, 10 to 13%, or if you're under 10, you're going to go by body weight. If you're over 15%, I would go based on lean body mass. So, you know, the one gram per, per protein, but then it's tough because other studies will say 1.5. So that's where the experimentation comes into play. If you try one gram of protein, one gram per pound of protein, and you feel great and you feel like you're recovering and you feel like your strength is good. I say you can stay there. Uh, I feel like if you're not recovering, you don't feel like you're getting any stronger, 
I'll bump it up, go to 1.25 and see how you feel. And then from there, go to 1.5. I don't really think you need more than 1.5. I know some people say go to two, but that's more in uh, specific periods where you're dieting and you're on extremely low fats or extremely low carbs and you need the extra protein. You can go up to two, but I would generally say anywhere from one to one and a half is what the studies show and what time and experience has shown. On the carb side of things, um, it's the same thing. We're looking at time and experience and studies. You're looking at two to three grams. But again, these are all variable numbers because if you're extremely overweight, you might not want to do three grams per pound of body weight. You might want to do one gram or 0.5 grams. Um, it depends if you're doing a keto diet. It depends if you're doing a South Beach diet. It depends if you're doing an Atkins diet. You might not want any carbs. So it depends. But for a balanced diet, for a take a 200 pound male that's not extremely overweight you know 15 percent body fat or under i would say two to three grams of carbs per pound of body weight in the off season is what you need to put on muscle to help aid in putting on muscle um but again if you are going to go higher in your fats you can go lower in your carbs and you don't have to do two to three grams you might be, be able to get away with one to two grams so these are all very, there's a lot of variables involved in each of these macros and it really depends on what kind of diet you like best and what you like to eat. Um, and if you, then if you're talking about car, uh, fats, again, if you're doing a keto diet, you're going to be super high fats. It might be, you know, two grams or a gram of fat per pound, uh, a body weight. If you're doing um, a carb protein diet, you might be down at like, 0.15 grams per pound of body fat, like, or per bo of body weight. So it, it depends, but the, I think a, a normal healthy dose of uh, fat in your diet made up mostly of healthy fats would be 0.35 grams per pound of body weight to 0.55 grams per pound of body weight, depending on what your body weight and depending on what the, what your carb count is. If you're really high in carbs, you're probably going to want to go on the lower end of fats. If you're lower on carbs, you can go on the higher end of the fats. Uh, but those are generally the numbers. So you're looking at, if, if you're talking about me personally, my diet, I'm probably going to go uh, one gram per pound of body weight for protein. I'm going to go two to three grams per pound of body weight for carbs. And I'm going to do 0.35 grams per pound of body weight for fats. That's for me personally. But the reason I can't give you a direct answer is because of all the other variables that matter when you're trying to decide what, mac what your macro makeup should be. So I wish it was a little bit more cut and dry, but I would have to know more information from the person I was helping to give them the proper numbers. Chris Ametti says, if I want to add as much size as possible, is there an advantage to competing once a year or would an extended off season be better? Um, this is tough. The proper answer is this. If you're a focused individual and you can stay on your diet and you can stay focused on eating the proper foods and your training does not suffer and you don't start snacking too much and you don't start binging here and there and you don't start missing meals, the longer the off season, the better. Okay. If you can stay in a, in a good surplus, not, it doesn't have to be like a 3000 calorie surplus, but if you can stay in a good surplus of calories, 500, a thousand, whatever, and you can just keep growing and, and you can stay on a strict diet. It, it could be a contest diet, which is more calories, you know, more food than you would normally eat, but contest makeup. If you can stay on that type of diet and not cheat, my personal belief is the longer you can do that for the more muscle, the more solid muscle you're going to put on and keep. I think people who compete too often are halting their, their bulking, uh, their bulking program. But the other thing too is one show a year is not too much because if you're going to do one show a year, that means you got, if you took four months to diet, which is a little bit much, but if you took four months to diet, that still leaves you, leaves you eight months to put on size. Eight months is a good off season, especially if you're extremely strict. If you're extremely strict, you're not missing meals, you're not, you know, drinking every night or drinking on the weekends every weekend or whatever. As long as you're really strict, 
eight months is a long off season. Um, but yeah, the more time you have, the better. I don't, I don't think cutting, if you're making gains and you're making good progress, I don't think cutting that short is, is necessary if you have time. Tamis A. Rowe says, at what age did you surpass your genetic limit? Uh, it's not as much age as it is weight. So my personal belief is that everybody has a weight where their body looks the best and where their genetic potential is kind of limited. Like, for example, mine was about 240. When I was about 240, 245, like really, really lean on stage, I feel like that's where I looked best. But it wasn't big enough to win. They weren't rewarding that size guy at that time. So they're like, you got to get bigger. So I got to 250, and I still wasn't winning. And once I broke 240 to 245, my physique started to change a little bit. My stomach got a little bit thicker. My obliques got a little bit thicker. Started to throw off my lines a little bit. And um, I finally got to 258 on stage. And I won a show because I was bigger. You know, they wanted me bigger and I got bigger. But I personally wasn't as pleased with my physique. And I know it was past what my genetic potential was. And genetic potential is a tough, a tough thing to say too, because if you grew, that means obviously you had more potential to grow, but where are you growing? You know, like that's why I say my genetic potential was about 240 because everything was growing proportionately and symmetrically properly until I broke that 240, 245 mark. And then more of the growth started in my stomach and less in the muscles where I wanted them to grow. So it's not as much age as it is you have to reach a certain weight and then your body will be like, okay, you're kind of maxed out. So whether that happens when you're 25 or 35 is up to you. Zaza89 says, is it possible to get some samples of the hostile SUPS or will you have a sample package upon release? Zaza89, uh, we will not have sample packs for sale or for distribution uh, upon release. We're going to have sample packs eventually, uh, but if for the first run or the first couple runs, we're just going to do a straight up purchase, but I'm positive people will like uh, what they're buying. So, but we won't be doing samples at first. It will be just straight tubs and samples will come a little later on. I know it makes sense to do it the other way around, but there's reasons why we can't do samples right now. So we're just gonna release the product at first and then samples will come down the road. Alp Gersecker says, how much strength gain is necessary for optimum or for maximum hypertrophy benefits? Uh, there isn't really a strength threshold for hypertrophy benefits because if I just started bodybuilding, anything I lift is going to cause hypertrophy, right? But it's more, what you're looking for is not a certain number in strength. What you're looking for is a progressive overload principle, which basically means you want to lift the most you can lift for X amount of reps. So let's say when I start bodybuilding, my bench press is 135 pounds for 10 reps. And I can max out at 10 reps. That's the most I can do for 10 reps, 135 pounds. You're building muscle. That's the most you can do. You're going to build muscle with 135. It's not like you have to lift 315 to gain muscle. What you have to do is challenge your body to gain muscle. So if 135 is hard for you and you're just starting out, that's your threshold. So you're going to build muscle there. But as your body starts to build muscle, 135 is going to start to seem lighter. You're going to start to do it 12 reps, 15 reps. Okay, well, I don't want to do 12 or 15 reps. I want to do 8 to 10. Okay, so add weight. So now you're doing 155-pound bench, 10 reps. You grew a little more. Then you're going to put on, you know, a quarter on each side with the 45s. Now you have 175, okay, or sorry, 185. You're going to do those for 10 reps. Now you're going to grow a little more. Once you start doing it, once you do that for 12 to 15, you're going to bump it up. Okay, you know what? I think I'm going to go to 225 and so on and so on and so on. And then that's what happens is your strength gain is based upon what you're maxing out with for 
X amount of reps that you've determined. In, in my determination, hypertrophy is best. The best result is between six to 10 reps, eight to 10 reps, somewhere in there. So you want to look at what your maximum rep range, maximum weight is for that rep range. That's where you're building muscle. And the strength is only determined by how many reps you're doing. So like I said, 135 at the start. And then, and okay, now I'm stronger. Okay, 225. Oh, now I'm stronger. Okay, 315. Oh, now I'm stronger. Okay, 405. When you've reached a place where you just don't think you're going to get any stronger, now it's reps. Okay, well, I only did 405 for six reps. Okay, next week I'm going to try and get seven. Then you get seven. Now you're building more muscle. Now you did eight. Now you're building more muscle. So, and then when you reach 10 and you don't, you know, if you can't go any heavier and you're at 10 and that's it, you're not going to, you know, you're not getting any stronger anymore. Then it's a matter of, how can I make this harder? Okay, maybe I'm going to do 405 with pause reps. I stop at the bottom and I press. How many times can I do that? Okay, six. Now I got to build that up for 10. And the progression continues. And that's how you build muscle. And that's the whole principle behind progressive overload is to constantly keep challenging your muscle with more weight or more reps or more intensity techniques or whatever it takes to make the set harder than it was the week before. That progressive overload, a progressive uh, pattern of hardship is what's gonna create hypertrophy and that's what you're looking for. So it's not necessarily, the question is how much strength gain. It's not how much strength gain, it's how much overload can you put on the muscle? And then you wanna progress from there and keep putting that overload on the muscle and that's how you get hypertrophy. As long as you're, of course, as long as you're fed properly, you're taking your supplements and all that. So that's kind of the question you want to ask yourself. Closino7 says, thoughts on glucose disposal agent supplements. I've seen more and more companies coming out with them, and I haven't seen many studies showing whether they really provide any significant benefit or is it BS. Uh, personally, I don't use them myself. I feel like they're a little overrated. Um, you know, I just talked to Stan Efforting. He says he goes, he says, the studies have shown that his 10 minute walk after eating uh, helps digest and absorb carbohydrates to the muscle better than metformin. Metformin is a drug specifically based on uh, glucose uptake. So I don't know. I, I don't feel like, I don't feel like those products are extremely beneficial. I feel like my body is using the carbs I need. Um, I don't feel like I need something to help me uptake carbs better or block carbs or whatever, whatever. I don't really, I feel like it's a really overrated supplement that I have never taken myself and I've never spent money on. Will hostile supplements have a glucose disposal agent? It's not in the, it's not in the books. It's not in our plans. And I don't, if people are clamoring for it, we will look into it further and see if it's something that we want to do. But I don't, I just don't believe in releasing anything that I don't use myself. And that's not for everything. It's just some things like, you know, like I don't eat greens, but it doesn't mean I don't think greens are valuable. Um, a greens powder can be very valuable. I just, I don't use one because I actually eat whole foods instead and try and get my greens in that way. But as far as the glucose disposal agent, I just, it's just not in our plans. I don't see it as being a valuable supplement. I don't know anybody or any pros that use one religiously and they love it and they, they feel like they're getting a lot of benefit from it. Um, if I had to guess, it'd be more marketing than, than actual evidence of it working, but I'm sure I could be wrong. If somebody can show me some evidence or a study that shows that how great they are, uh, I would be more than happy to start trying them. But uh, like I said, I don't, I don't see the value in them myself. Poetry by Moses says, what do you do for recovery? Foam roll, salt bath, yoga, uh, all of the above, except yoga. I want to do yoga. I just haven't gotten around. To, <laughs> I haven't gotten around to it. <laughs> is that the normal excuse everybody uses? Uh, yoga is actually very beneficial. I, and I have always wanted to do it. I just haven't got around to it because... I haven't made it a priority. It's really just my own laziness. But I do do the foam rolling. 
especially on like uh, tender or injured areas, maybe if I have tendonitis in an area, like if I have tendonitis on my elbow or if I have a, you know, my, like my teres minor in my armpit from the back gets really sore. Sometimes gets really tight or my quads, like my IT bands that run down the side of your quad really get, get really tight all the time. Uh, hamstrings get really tight. So foam rolling is very beneficial. I think I know some people have come up with studies that say it doesn't do anything personally. I feel better after I do it. So, you know, if you tell me it doesn't do anything, but I feel better, I, I can't go with that study. I have to go with, it feels better. Even if it's in my own head, it feels better. So like, I'll give you an example right now. I have uh, a nagging, in, a nagging injury in my, it's not an injury. It's just a nagging spot in my rear delt. I've been foam rolling it every day for the past well, week or two, and it's starting to get better. Now, Foam rolling is not the only way I, I go about my recovery. Foam rolling plus ice. I actually do the ice after the foam rolling because I feel like if you foam roll properly, like if you use your real body weight to get into something, you're putting a lot of trauma into that area. You're putting a lot of stress on that muscle. So I usually ice right after to reduce the inflammation that I've caused. Um, what else do I do for recovery? Rest. A lot of rest. On my off days, I rest a lot. I run a lot of errands. I don't, uh, I try not to do anything too active. Um, but yeah, I take a hot tub. I'll do the hot tub and then a cold shower after. Uh, that actually feels really, really good. It's very refreshing. I feel like it, I feel like it kind of refreshes my central nervous system almost. But the, the hot tub has got to be really hot. Like mine's 105. Or you can do a sauna. Uh, you can do a really hot sauna and then do a cold shower after, afterwards that actually feels really good. Or if you actually have, um, if you have access to a hot and cold tub, that's the best way to do it. You can do five minutes on a hot tub, five minutes on a cold tub and repeat. Um, so that's another thing I do is the hot tub, cold shower. And, um, yeah, hot tub, cold shower, foam roll. And believe it or not, cardio, you know, a lot of people say, Oh, do you lose card? Do you cardio to lose fat? Blah, blah. My cardio is actually more for recovery and appetite. So I would include cardio in the recovery, especially after legs. Like the day after legs, when my legs are really sore, that's when I, I want to do cardio the most because it helps speed up that recovery process and decrease the amount of time I'm sore for. So all of those things have to work together. And then lastly, um, and this is more prevention, not recovery, but I use a lot of Tiger Bomb. I use a lot of Tiger Bomb on sore joints and things like that to help them uh, get the blood to them before uh, training. Oh, one other recovery tool I use is the um, Electro Stim. So I have an Electro Stim pad that I place it on top of like a nagging area and, you know, do the, I don't know if you guys have seen the Electro Stim, but it pulses with the muscle. Uh, that helps draw blood to the area, which is good for recovery as well. So there's a lot of different things. There's so many different things you can do for recovery. The massage gun is valuable. Like all of these things are used at one point or another and you use them in conjunction. And you actually can save a lot of money on massage therapists and things like that by learning how to use them on your own. JD fit warrior says thoughts on cardio post-workout while trying to put on size. 10 to 20 minutes, elliptical, jogging, et cetera. Um, I, I think cardio post-workout is fine. I don't think it's going to crush your gains or anything like that, especially if it's only 10 or 20 minutes. I actually think if you just do 10 minutes, like walking on a treadmill or on a bike or something like that, it will help speed up the recovery process and is actually really good for you. I think the problem is, especially if you've taken an intra workout, if you took an intra workout, then you have – if you took a good intro workout, then you have a lot of essential aminos already in your body. So you don't have to rush home after the gym and eat. So like, for example, our intro workout has essential aminos in it. So you would drink your intro workout. You kind of muscles will kind of fed that way a little bit. And then you can do 10 minutes of cardio to help with recovery and, and just kind of help digesting whatever you had in your system. And then when you get home, you're ready for a meal. I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I think it's actually very, very beneficial and uh, more people should do it. Zanluca says, how important are fast carbs for insulin spike pre and after workouts? 
Uh, pre, I don't use them. Um, pre, I just have a regular meal like chicken and rice or whatever. But intra, I believe in having some carbs. Doesn't have to be a lot, just a little bit of carbs to help spike, help replenish glycogen stores. And then post workout, um, I think carbs, po- simple carbs post workout is what you really want. Pre, not, not as important. Um, post, though, I definitely think is important. I don't know. It's definitely to spike your insulin, but we're just looking to recover and replenish glycogen. So it doesn't have to be like 200 grams of simple carbs. If you just do like 50 grams post-workout and then eat a regular meal, that will have you covered simple and complex. You know, if you just do like, uh, you know, rice or potato or something like that with your meal and then you do if you just when you're as soon as you finish your workout if you do 50 grams of simple carbs that you get your simple carbs taken in and then when you get home you get your complex carbs taken in and you're kind of covered all your bases i think that is actually very beneficial and uh, that's another thing we're looking at coming out with ourselves our own carb powder because it's something i do believe in Uh, but like i said not necessarily pre i think a lot of guys do pre because maybe they take insulin or things like that we're not you know, I don't do it. I don't do that. So I don't ever need the pre. I just eat my pre-workout meal. I take my pre-workout drink and then I have my intra-workout shake and then I have my post-workout carbs. Mo Bay Rakdar says, can you be, can a bodybuilder be fertile on TRT? Uh, bodybuilder can be fertile. Okay. First, let me say I'm not a doctor. So this is not a factual recommendation or a factual, how can I word it? <laughs> I'm not a doctor, okay? But from past experience, uh, friends that have gotten wives pregnant and things like that, you don't, you can be fertile on a cycle, you can be fertile on TRT, you're fertile off completely, obviously. Just because you're on, if you if you start taking a cycle and you're on, it does not mean that uh, you're infertile. And if you're on TRT, it also doesn't mean you're infertile. That's being infertile is something completely different. Um, it's not necessarily directly connected to being on. I know some people think it is, but it's that's not true. Uh, the only way to know if you're infertile is to go to a, a doctor, a fertility doctor, and find out that way. Leo Big says, are you planning on a sponsor sh- on sponsoring athletes and influencers in the future? If yes, then what do you look for in them? Actually, this is a good question. Uh, I would like to sponsor athletes and influencers in the future. I'm not sure when we're going to start doing that. Uh, but I do think it's important because I want to give back to the community that gave so much to me. And I would like to find, you know, young prospects that really uh, want to be part of the brand. What would I look for in them? The first thing I would look for is loyalty. I want somebody who's excited, who really wants to be part of something and doesn't just want to be part of anything. But one of the things that matters to me the most is, do you like my products? Because I don't want anybody promoting my products that doesn't like them. I Okay, here's some transparency for you. Back in the day, I was signed to a major company, way back. I was signed to a, a, one of the ma- biggest companies in the industry. And... I didn't like all their products, but I signed off on a lot of things. And I learned very quickly that's not the bodybuilder I wanted to be. After that contract ended from then forward, uh, I decided I would never do that again. And for the last nine, maybe nine years now, I've been able to keep that track record. I was with another company that had... 300 different products and they were like how come you only post about these five or six and i was like well those are the only five or six i use guys like well maybe you can post about this one over here i'm like i can't do that and it's actually very very important to me i look i get messages all the time from people hey can you can you do a post about this therapy thing can you do a post about this waist trainer can you and and sometimes i do but it's only if i use it And I tell people very, very upfront, 
if you're giving me this product because you want me to post about it, because some people give it to you without saying anything. Uh, I won't post about it unless I actually really like it. If I like it, I'll post about it. So if you're willing to take that chance, that's fine. I'll take it and I'll use it. And if I like it, I'll post about it. If I don't, you're probably never going to see it on my page. And some people take the chance and some people don't. But it's very important to me that my athletes, one day when I have athletes, hopefully, uh, that they are extremely happy with our brand and our supplements and that they believe in them because if they don't their videos are going to be bullshit they're going to sound like shit they're not going to want to promote the product um it's just not it's really just not a good thing i because i want people to be involved and enjoy what we have and really talk about it highly and people can only do that listen some people are good salespeople and they can say things and make it sound real but most people you can tell when they're full of shit so i don't want athletes on my roster that don't like our don't like our products because i don't i don't want them to come off as fake so that's the first thing i look at right do you like the products you're using or selling or promoting um the second thing is do you have a following are you active Okay. Maybe you have 200,000 followers. Maybe you have a hundred thousand followers. Do they comment on your posts? And if they do, do you comment back? Are you, are you interactive with them? Do you talk back to them? Even if it's just a hi, hello, a thank you, whatever. Are you interactive? Are the comments positive? Obviously everybody has a troll here and there, but I mean like for the most part, are the comments positive or is your interactive, is your interaction positive? Um, how do people view you? These things all matter to me. Um, does your page look authentic? Is it really you? Okay. This is another thing that matters to me. So your social media matters. Um, your work ethic matters. And I don't just mean like, how much are you going to promote our brand? I mean, do you work hard in the gym? Cause I'm trying to create, I have a, I have a vision of what, I have an idea of what my work ethic is and I want my team that's with me on this journey of building a supplement company to have the same work ethic. I want gritty, hungry people that like just are almost obsessive in their ambition and people that are very proactive. So I'm kind of describing a unicorn. Like, well, I want everything I want, but this is, these are all traits that people would like to have in an employee or an athlete, a sponsored athlete, whatever, whatever you call it. I, I just want people to be as invested as I am. Okay. You ever see that picture? Uh, what's the difference between a leader and a boss and the boss is sitting back on a, a carriage and he's whipping his employees. And then you have the other one, which is the leader who's actually in the front, in front of his employees, and he's tugging the rope first. I, I, I would like to build that type of thing at, in our company where I don't expect anything, anything from anybody that I'm not doing myself. But if I'm doing it, I expect it from everybody else. So the athlete has to be authentic. They have to like the product. They have to be able to work hard. They have to be able to keep up with what I'm doing. They have to have good social media and they have to have aspirations. How is their competition history? Do they, do they want to compete? Do they want to get better? Are they building something? Maybe they don't want to compete, but they want to build their name and their brand. All these things matter. All these things matter. It's not, it's not one thing. It's you, you get a picture of who somebody is and how hard they work and what they want. And those are the factors that matter. So, you know, a lot of people think, well, I have 500,000 followers. I should get this and I should get that. I'm like, okay, but do your followers believe you? Are you a credible person? Have you taught them anything? Are you giving them anything back? Or are you just a really pretty face? And that's why you have 500,000 followers. Cause that happens. Uh, you know, so having a big number of followers is not enough because it doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's who are those followers? Who, how is your interaction with them? 
are you appreciative of them? Are you thankful that they care what you're doing? Or are you an ass and you take them all for granted? Like you have to check a lot of boxes, I think. And maybe that's more than other companies are asking, but I'm trying to build more. I want our company to be more. I want our company to be very transparent, very authentic, and I expect the same from my athletes. Devin Smith says, how do you avoid just straight up getting fat with the amount of calories you eat? I weigh 210 pounds at 6'2 and have already lost 110 pounds, so you were 320, and still have at least 20 to 25 pounds more to lose before I can start my bulk. Afraid if I start now, I'll just get fat. Okay. That needs a sip of coffee. So first of all, you can't be scared of food. Okay. You have to eat more. It's not just about losing weight all the time. At some point you have to stop shredding and be like, okay, I need to build muscle. One of the biggest mistakes people make is they want to diet away all the fat. So they cut their calories too low and they lose a bunch of weight, but they lose muscle in the process. Your basal metabolic rate, your daily caloric intake is, is determined by your body size and your muscle mass. So my daily caloric intake say is going to be around 3,500 calories. Whereas a guy who has half the amount of muscle as me is going to be about 1,700 calories, or, you know, 2,000 calories, whatever. So you don't want to diet away muscle because that means you can only eat less. The more muscle you diet away, the less food you have to eat. The key to looking good is holding on to all your muscle while you lose weight. And the way to do that, if, you're, if I was advising somebody who was overweight, who still want to lose weight but want to hold their muscle, I would advise them on a carb cycling diet or a calorie cycling diet where you have a, a day of deficit, a day of maintenance, and a day of surplus. Okay, that will allow you to keep muscle and still burn fat throughout the whole week. So you'll have a net deficit for the week. If you just keep shredding, keep shredding, keep shredding. And if you are going to keep shredding, as long as you're trying to maintain the muscle while you're shredding. So you're in a small deficit. So if you're allowed to eat 3,000 calories for the day, you're going to be at 2,800, 2,900. And you're going to bump your cardio a little bit to make up more deficit. But if you're in a huge deficit, that muscle is going to come off at the same time. So my advice to you with this exact thing that you've sent me is this. If you want to lose 20 to 25 more pounds of fat, not weight, of fat, I would look at your exact basal metabolic needs for the day. Find out exactly what your cal caloric needs are for the day. And from there, subtract them by 200. And just do that. And just try it. You can... You can still change the way your body looks and maintain all the muscle you have while losing that fat, those 200 calories a day. That little bit of a deficit, I don't personally think will cause you to lose muscle. So it's the longer, slower approach, but it's a way, of, way, it's a way for you to look better at the end and also a way for you to maintain the lifestyle. A lot of people, when they yo-yo back and forth, it's because they have cut their calories too far. And as soon as they reach their desired goal, they're like, okay, I can eat now. And then their weight just fluctuates back up. The key is to look at it as a long road, very short, very small uh, deficits in your caloric intake for the day and for a long periods of time. Otherwise, you try the caloric, uh, the, the calorie cycling approach and see how that works for you. That's also something that a lot of people get a lot of benefit from. You carb cycling, you do a high day, two low days, a high day, two low days. This way your body, you're manipulating your calories every day. You're going to start to burn some fat. So there's a couple of different ways you can go about it. But the last thing on earth you want to do is just convince yourself that I got to lose 25 more pounds. And I means I got to keep my calories really low so I can lose that. Because you're going to just gonna lose muscle. And you're going to lose the 25 more pounds. And you're going to be like, okay, I hit my target weight, but I don't look the way I want to look. But that's because the muscle came off with the fat, right? That's why some people, you see them diet so hard and do so much cardio and their body, it looks big and sloppy. And then 
they're dieting and doing all this cardio and their body just shrinks, but it still looks sloppy. It's like, okay, you went from 300 pounds to 200 pounds, but your body didn't look any better. It's because you were in too big a deficit and you burned too much fat in the process. So your body didn't get a chance to change. The body composition didn't change. All you did was lose weight. So that means you lost fat, you lost muscle, you lost water, you lost everything, weight in general. If you just want to burn fat, you got to try one of the two approaches that I mentioned. Dan S. Nevad, 40. Sorry, guys, I'm trying my best. How long did it take before you started to see muscle separation when you first started lifting? Example, your legs. How long would it take for someone who has been training for a year and has put on size but isn't seeing any separation yet? Separation is something that happens over time. And I know you're asking how long, but it's going to depend on the person and how hard they train. Um, I believe I train pretty hard. I think everybody thinks they train pretty hard, but let's assume you train pretty hard. Let's assume I train pretty hard. It took me year one, two, three, every year. Okay, if you're looking for the separation I have now, I'm going to tell you it's going to take five years at least, maybe six or seven. Separation, if it's not genetic, it is under it's it's time it just takes time it takes time for muscle to mature the more a muscle matures the more separated it's going to be okay if you grow too fast the process could take even longer i mean you see some guys some of these guys that go to kuwait uh, not all of them some they explode with muscle but the separation's not deep it's all new muscle right the older, and this is just my opinion, but the older the muscle, the more mature the muscle, the more the muscle's been trained, the more separated it's going to be. So you shouldn't look at it like, okay, Fuad said it's going to take two years. So after two years, I look, well, my legs aren't separated. What's wrong? There's nothing wrong. It just depends. How, everybody's different. Everybody's genetics are different. Some guys, I mean, look at like, okay, look at Ian Vellier. Okay. Guy turned pro at like 23 years old. Completely separated quads. Me at 23 years old, kind of looked a little mushy. It wasn't really deep, deep cuts. The deep, deep cuts didn't really come in for me until I was like 27, 28. And then they got deeper every year after that. So you have to look at it as a long game where you're like, okay, I don't have deep cuts in my legs. Can I train harder? That would be the first part of the, the equation is because if I, I can train harder, not to the point of overtraining or, or, you know, beating up your muscle, but am I training hard enough? And if I am, then I just have to, it just takes time because everybody's genetics are different. Some people are going to be harder, leaner, and more separated younger than others. But even if you are that person with those genetics, it's still going to take time under the bar. It's not something that just happens just because, or all of a sudden at two years or five years, it just all of a sudden you have this like miraculous leg separation. No, I just, when I think back to my career, I think, okay, I, I look back at like year one, just mush, just like two big slabs of meat. There was nothing there. Year two, a little bit more, year three, a little bit more, year four. And it also depends how lean you are. I mean, some people hold more, hold more fat and water in the lower body than others. So it depends how lean you are. Like for me, I hold most of my fat in my love handles and my glutes. So my quads look like they're lean all year round, but my ass is fat and my love handles are fat and that's where I carry everything. I have like my cheeseburger tits doesn't look good either. So everybody's going to carry their fat in a different place. And if you carry your fat in your quads, it's going to take aside from the other two things I mentioned, it's going to take you longer uh, on a diet and a harder diet to get that fat to strip away to really see the cuts that you want to see. So all these different variables come into effect, but it's not necessarily, don't look at it like a time thing. Like it's been two years, where are my cuts? It's just a maturity thing and a leanness and, and all that, all those factors don't come into play. Roman Fritz, Mr. IFBB Pro, Roman, Roman Fritz says, how many 10 minute walks have you done since Stan was on? Roman, I am completely transparent. You know that I have done zero. And that's not because I don't believe in what, what Stan said. Stan actually made very, very good sense. I just, my thing is this. There's two things. I really, really like my morning cardio. 
I like getting out of the house and I like getting to the gym. It starts my day. I like having a coffee on the way to the gym. I like getting on the step mill and I kind of just zone out and I go through my 40 minutes or half an hour, whatever I'm doing of cardio. And I feel very refreshed afterwards. So I don't want to stop that. Now, doesn't mean I can't do stands, 10 minute walks and do the 40 minutes of cardio. So the only reason I haven't started yet is because I want to buy a bike. I don't want to go walk around the neighborhood for 10 minutes. I just don't. It's not what I, <laughs> it doesn't sound like very much fun to me. But I, I, I want to buy a stationary bike so that after I'm done eating, I can just put my, put, I'm going to put the bike in front of the TV. And after I'm done eating, I'll just go for a 10 minute bike ride. And then that's it. So I do plan on doing the 10 minute walks, but it doesn't mean I'm going to stop doing my morning cardio. Uh, the morning cardio is more for just my mental clarity, my mental health. Whereas the 10 minute bike rides after eating, those will be for uh, glucose uptake and digestion because that's what Stan says they do. And I, I actually believe him. So it's something I will start once I get that bike in place. Danny Strong says, how do you control your stress when life gets busy and hectic? Also, I respect that you're always calm when speaking, even when debating. I'm not very calm. I actually have a bad temper, but I try my, <laughs> try my hardest to, uh, I try my hardest to stay calm. I'm, I'm a lot better now than I was when I was younger, but uh, how do I control my stress? Let me see. So lately I've actually had a lot of stress. So starting the business and still trying to be a bodybuilder all, all my career, I've just been, how can I be the best bodybuilder? I didn't care about anything else. I wasn't good at the business of bodybuilding. I was like, how do I get my meals in? How do I get bigger? How do I get better? How do I win? That's all I care about. Stress level wasn't too bad when you're focused on one thing. Now I'm focused on, okay, I want this podcast to do really well. I want to be a good bodybuilder. I'm launching this company. I want the supplement company to do really well. So I have a lot of stuff on my plate and it actually has increased my stress quite a bit. I found that if I just make lists and I try and knock them down, I find the biggest, the most stressful thing in the world is procrastination. If Even if it's the smallest thing, right? If I know I have something to do and I don't do it, it will eat away at me. Even if I stop thinking about it, it's somewhere in the back of my head that it's something I have to get done and it will cause me stress. I'll, I'll obsess over it without obsess. It's weird. It's like I'm not thinking about it, but I am. It's there and it's ruining my mood and it's causing anxiety and it's making me stress out. So the number one thing I found to reduce stress is to get things done. Get off your ass and do the things you have to do. Because if you're just laying around on the fucking couch or if you're ignoring things because you want to do something else that you're not supposed to be doing, that stress is going to compound on itself. And that's what I've noticed. And it might not be for everybody. Some people may be able to put things aside and not worry about them. But it, I've, been doing, I've been like this my whole life. And I only realized in the last year or so that if I just knock down the things, if I just check the list, okay, I have to do this thing, these things today. Check, 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 check. Maybe it was a really busy day. Maybe I didn't have time to talk to anybody or do anything fun. But at the end of the day at nine o'clock at night when I sit down on the couch, I feel really relaxed. My stress level is very low. And I actually feel pretty proud of myself for getting everything done that I had to get done. The days I feel like shit or I'm in a mood or I'm stressed out or like I'm just, uh, I'm in a funk. It's because I know there was something I had to do that I didn't, even if it's so small as like going to the grocery store. Okay, I got to go to the grocery store. I got to get some mac and cheese because mac and cheese is delicious. And I didn't go. Well, I can eat some rice today instead. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. But I told myself there was something I wanted to do and I didn't go do it. That's how obsessive I am about it. That will sit in my head and be like, why didn't you go to the grocery store? So anyway, Take it full circle. It just, you know, I've already said it a couple of times. The number one way, in my opinion, to reduce stress is to get the stuff done around you. Just whatever is on your plate, no matter how small it is, even like I said, if it's just going to the grocery store, get that shit done. Even if it means you have to ignore some of the, the people in your life for a minute, get all your shit done. And then I promise you at the end of the day, when you sit down, you'd be like, okay, I got to make a new list for tomorrow, but I feel pretty good because I got today's list done and my stress level is just 
it just, it may start here during the day, but as I get things done, it just starts to go, 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 go. And you feel good at the end of the day. So that's my number one advice for everybody for reducing stress. Nas by one says, do pros use creatine? Uh, yes. As far as I know, sometimes it's not individual. I mean, sometimes pros will you, I mean, it's not pros. It's really everybody. It's a very common supplement, but, um, and I shouldn't say pros because I don't want to speak for other people. I use creatine. Sometimes I would add creatine to my pre-workout. Sometimes my pre-workout has creatine in it. It just depends, you know, what product I was using. Um, but I do think creatine is very beneficial and I think a lot of people use it. So I would venture to say that most pros are using creatine. Abstrom 97 says off season for an advanced lifter, how much weight increase to aim for weekly or monthly for an advanced lifter. So you're saying somebody who's been lifting for like five years or more, I would say it depends if you're on a dirty bulk, you can gain as much weight as you want. We were talking off season, right? So if you're on a dirty bulk, you could put on 10 pounds a month, 15 pounds a month. It doesn't matter because you're like, I don't care if I get fat. I've been there. I put on 80 pounds one off season. Uh, but I wasn't advanced at that time. As an advanced bodybuilder, the most I put on the off season is 50. Okay, that's over the course of, you know, eight months. Um, but I put on that 50 in the first couple months and I just held that there and kind of grew into it. What I would say is if you're asking me, you're asking me how much weight increase to aim for weekly. Now, if you're trying to do it without becoming a fat pig, like I'm doing a lean bulk right now, I'd say one or two pounds. You're not going to gain, even if you've done everything perfectly, you're not going to gain more than a couple pounds of muscle a month. And I'm talking if you're on, if you're on all the PEDs, if you're on... Uh, every you're taking all your supplementations perfect. All your nutrition is on, is bang on. Your training is stellar. If you're an advanced lifter, you're looking at two pounds a month of muscle tissue max, and that's if everything's perfect. So, how much more weight do you want to gain? You know, so I say five to ten pounds a month max, and it's not even going to be every month. You may put that on initially, and then you may just sit at, at, a, at, a sur, at a surplus weight because you don't want to just keep putting on weight. If I put my, my cal calories up around 4,000 calories, I'll start gaining weight slowly. Let's say after a month I've put on, like this month, I just passed my lean bulk. I put on six pounds. Okay. I feel like I'm in pretty good shape still. If I put on another six pounds and it's not, and I'm in the same shape, I'll be okay. But if I put on another six pounds and I'm just sloppier, I got to pull back a bit. So you're not continuously just going to gain five pounds every month. Cause if you're on an eight month off season and it's a lean bulk and you put on 40 pounds, it may not look so good in a lean bulk. Okay. And if you're on a dirty bulk, if you put on 25 pounds in the first month, you're probably not going to keep gaining 25 pounds a month. You're going to gain that 25 pounds and you're going to sit there and hold it. So the question you should be asking is how much muscle weight can somebody hope for? And the answer is two pounds a month. If everything is perfect, if everything is bang on two pounds a month, if you're asking me how much weight is acceptable to put on in an off season, that depends on the person. I personally don't care if I'm, if I'm really trying to put on muscle, I will, I've been up at 310 pounds and I compete at 255. So that means I put on almost 60 pounds, you know, or 55 pounds, 53 pounds of, of bot of extra weight that came off, whether it was water or glycogen or whatever, stomach contents, doesn't matter. The point is if you're, if you don't care about how you look, then fucking eat, eat good food, eat lots of food, and put on as much weight as you can. But if you're in a lean bulk and you're like, how much weight should I put on? Like five pounds a month, five pounds a month. And it might not be every month. It might only be for three, four months. And then you might have to stop there because you might be getting too soft. MCARPS48 says, in your words, what is a working set and what is the proper way to, to perform it? I've, I've, 
uh, sorry, he's missing a word here. I think he says, I've used this term many times, but never truly understood it. A working set is exactly that. Are you working? So in my, in my uh, vocabulary for training, I have warm-up set, feeder set, working set. That's how my sets go. And then obviously there's a whole bunch of intensity techniques. You say I use a drop set, a pause, rest pause set, blah, blah, blah. But traditionally I would say warm-up set, um, feeder set, and working set. And what that means is this. Warm-up set is, let's take bench press, for example. Warm-up set is I may lay down and do the bar. I may do the bar and I may do a plate. And those are, they feel like, obviously they feel like nothing. So that's my warm-up weight. I'm just getting my muscle. And this is maybe bro science. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But for me, I'm just getting my muscle acclimated to the exercise. I want to get that motion. I want to get the muscle used to the motion. Okay. From there, I get into feeder sets. I want to start feeling a little bit of weight. I'm not going to go to failure. I'm not trying to burn out the muscle. I might go from one plate. I might go to two plates. Okay, let me do, you know, I'll do eight reps, six to eight reps. From there, I'm going to go to uh, two and a quarter, say. I'll do another six to eight reps. Okay, now I'm at three plates. That's a working set for me. Now, it's going to be different for everybody. A working set to me is 80% of your 10 rep max. If we're talking, if, you, if that's your goal is like eight to 10 reps, a working set to me is 80% of your 10 rep max. So if you're doing eight reps and, and 10 reps is your max, that's a working set. So if I do 315 for eight, uh, I, you know, I can probably do more than 10 reps, but if I do 315 for eight, that's a working set, okay? At, that made the muscle work. Now, is it my, my all-out set? No, because working sets have a range. I, I believe working sets have a range. 70, 80, 90% failure. That's kind of your working range to me, okay? Other people might not be. Other people may think, no, it's just 90%. Like if you look at Dorian Yates, Dorian Yates would count his last set as his working set. That's it. That's the one he goes to failure on. That's the one that's working. That's it. That's not how I see it. I think if I'm benching 315 for eight, my muscle is working. My muscle is going to grow from that. That's how I count a working set. From there, I may do 365. I may do it again for another eight. It's still not failure. I got knocked out eight. Eight was tough. I could probably get one or two more reps. That's also working. It's a working set. That made my chest work. From there, I made it go to 405. Okay, now I'm 405 on the bench. I could probably knock out eight max, maybe nine, maybe 10 on a good day. But that's my max rep range. That's failure. That's everything. That I call a failure set. So you have warm up, feeder, working, failure. And the reason I say that is this your feeder sets, I don't believe if you've gotten strong enough, are going to be working. They're not going to build muscle. They're going to pump blood and they're going to, you know, you could do, if I do a whole, whole, ex, whole workout with 225, I'm still going to maintain muscle. I don't think I'm going to grow any new muscle. It's not going to cause any real trauma unless I'm doing like 20, 30 reps. But at the 10 rep mark, it's not going to cause any real trauma. If I get to 315, I think I'm going to cause trauma there. That's going to cause trauma to my chest. It's going to help tear down muscle so that it can regrow and get bigger. At 365, it's also a working set because it's also going to tear down muscle. It's going to regrow new muscle. And at 405, it's also a working set, but I call it a failure set because that's the most I can do for 10 reps. That's my failure set. That's my all out. I did everything I could. One more rep and the bar is going to crush me. So that's kind of how I separate my warm up, my feeder, my working, and my failure sets. Now, some people call feeder sets warm up, warm up sets as well. So some people just might have warm up, working, and feeder. I, or sorry, warm up, working, and failure. Whereas I have kind of four where I go warm up, which doesn't do anything feeder which is kind of like maintenance and then working which is building and then failure which is all out and you can't go any higher diego rivera 805 says when you're cutting are you supposed to feel like shit at the gym as well it depends on cutting 
if you're cutting for a show and you have a deadline and you've depleted yourself so much that you're trying to burn off like last ounces of fat, yeah, you're probably going to feel like shit. You're going to feel at the gym. You're going to feel like shit at the gym. You're going to feel like shit at home. You're probably not going to sleep well. Once your body fat gets really low, it's going to put you in a horrible mood. All these things are going to happen to you. If you feel like shit because you're trying to get ripped for the beach, you've done something wrong. If you're just trying to get ripped, but you don't have a deadline, we talked about this earlier in the podcast, set smaller deficits so that you burn fat over longer periods of time and you don't feel like shit. The only time you start to feel like shit, like you're talking about, is if you've depleted yourself or, or you've made the deficit so high that like, for example, if you're allowed to eat 3,000 calories a day and you're eating two, you're going to feel like shit. That's a huge deficit. So in my opinion, if you want to eliminate the, the shitty feeling, I would increase the food so it's a smaller deficit. Instead of eating, if you're allowed to eat 3,000 calories, instead of eating 2,000, eat 2,800. And take a longer approach so you feel good while you're training. Your training's good. You're going to keep more muscle. You're going to feel better. You're going to sleep better. All these things are going to be better if you're in less of a deficit. So this is why you need to uh, be in a smaller deficit instead of this. If you feel like shit, you're, you've gone too far. You're being too aggressive with it. Seth Winterhalter says, pump versus stim. How often do you use both, separate or together? Should they be cycled? What type of workouts for each, etc.? Simply looking for knowledge regarding how to use these effectively. Okay, uh, let's just break this down. And I'll break it down using our company. Other companies may be different. Well, actually, I'll, I'll try and touch on a few others. So some companies have a stim pre-workout. That pre-workout doesn't have much in the way of endurance or uh, pump products. It might have a little bit, but not a lot. But it's mostly made up of stimulant ingredients. So those are ingredients that are just going to get you really energized. You're going to get your blood pressure up, get your heart rate up, you're going to get everything going so that when you're in the gym, you have tons and tons of energy and you feel great. Now, the problem with stims is if you go too high on a stim and the number, the threshold for caffeine seems to be about 375 milligrams. So I don't know how that works with when you're adding, because some companies will add caffeine at 300 or 400, but then they'll add a whole bunch of other smaller smaller amounts still 50 50 milligrams of this 50 milligrams of this 50 milligrams. so you're almost up and now at six or seven hundred milligrams of just stimulants what that does is actually constrict blood vessels and it's going to reduce your pump so you're going to feel really energized in the gym like oh i'm doing all this stuff and i, I i'm going out crazy and i could work out for three hours but it's actually giving you the reverse effect that you want because you've constricted the blood vessel which is going to allow not allow you to get the pump that you want so that's why I'm not a stim. I don't really promote heavy stim pre-workouts because I don't, one, I don't like the way they feel. Two, I feel like they're unhealthy. There's too much in the way of high blood pressure and heart rate, too much effect on those two things. And lastly, if we're talking about just straight muscle and not worried about health, it's limiting my pump, which I don't want it to do. Should stims be cycled? Yes, because... You're, you can build a tolerance to them. And before you know it, you're taking two and three scoops and you're really done a lot of damage to your, um, you really done, da you've, you've increased your blood pressure too much. You've increased your heart rate too much. Your adrenal glands have like, are being taxed all the time. And I just don't think it's healthy to be on a high sim all the time. And the best way to do it is if you cycle off of them once a month for a week, you can go back to that one scoop and still feel great. I still don't think a lot of stims even in one scoop is a good idea. But if you're building a tolerance to the point where you need two and three scoops, you definitely need to detox a little bit. Okay, so that's the stim side of things. Proper pre-workouts have some stim, but they have some endurance products. They have some pump products. They have, or ingredients, I should say. They have some pump ingredients, endurance ingredients, uh, strength ingredients, energy ingredients, focus ingredients. A good pre-workout will give you a full array, a full spectrum of ingredients that will allow you to feel good, build muscle, be stronger, have tons of energy, and get a great pump, okay? So they're not focused on one thing. A good pre-workout will kind of give be the jack of all trades. There's a full 
spectrum. We're going to make you feel great. You go work out, build your muscle, come back to us when you're done. Then you have just pump products. Oh, sorry. As far as cycling off a regular pre-workout depends on the regular pre-workout. If it's lower in stim, for example, ours is 300 milligrams. That's it. There's no other little stimulants. It's 300 milligrams of caffeine. There's two different types of caffeine and that's all the stim you're going to get in our product. Now it will make you feel great, but it's not because of the stimulants. So the stimulants are only one aspect that will make you feel good, but we have other ingredients that are going to help you with that too. And those ingredients will not raise blood pressure, will not increase your heart rate, will not constrict blood vessels. So we kind of did our homework on this. Now, if you're on a pre-workout that is lower in stim, say below 300 or you know around that number, I don't believe that you have to cycle off it. If you start not feeling it, you're like, oh, I don't feel it anymore. You could need a break from it. That's just going to depend on each person. Now, when you talk about pump products, now you're talking about a product that's solely based on pump, right? We're not focused on strength. We're not focused on endurance. We're not focused on energy. We're not focused on focus, not focused on focus, we're not worried about focus. Our only focus, our only worry is how much pump, how can I, can I really increase this pump to the max? And that's what pump products do. They usually consist of two, three, four, five different pump ingredients because we're attacking the blood vessel from different angles so that we can cause this swell of blood in the muscle that will give you this pump that's like out of this world, okay? Most pump products are very low in stim because pump products generally are for people that don't like stimulants. Um, sometimes they have a little bit of focus ingredients, but usually the pump product is main, is sole focus, is sole purpose is to increase pump in the gym and that's why you take it. Those. I don't believe you have to cycle off those at all because I don't think there's anything detrimental to your health about pump ingredients. So I don't personally think that you have to cycle off uh, pump products, but I can't say that as a whole because I don't know what is in all the pump products. But uh, if they're solely focused on pump ingredients, then I don't necessarily see a reason why you'd have to cycle off them. Now, there are people, it depends on the company and the ingredient list, but if you're taking a pre-workout that's super high in stim and you don't mind that, you don't mind the health ramifications and you're okay with all those things, some people then will go buy a pump product and combine the two. I don't feel like you have to do that, but you can if you're crazy. If you, <laughs> I've, I've, I go crazy sometimes and I'm like, okay, I want to have a great leg workout. So I'll take our pre-workout and I'll take our pump workout and I'll mix them together. and it's a nice effect, right? We're trying to just, it might be overkill. It's probably in my head, but I like the way it feels. I think, I think generally if you have good products, you can take them individually, but some companies out there make them specifically to be combined. I can, I know one off the top of my head, but I, I, like I said, I won't name names. I don't think it's a bad thing. It's just there. That's the way they want to do things they recommend combining their stimulant pre-workout with their pump product. And by mixing the two, you get the full array of everything you need. Other companies put the full array in one bottle. So it just depends on what company you, what is more your preference. Okay. Last one. Do you recommend getting post workout carbs from food or from carb supplement? Uh, we kind of touched on this one. Uh, Vince Rosetta says, uh, we kind of touched on this one a little bit. I actually believe in both. So you're going to get a little bit of simple carbs from a carb supplement, either during or after your workout. And then you're going to get your complex carbs from your post-workout meal. But I do believe in both because I want to shuttle some, I want to shuttle some of the simple carbs in there right away. And then I want to have some complex carbs after that are going to stick around for a while. So that's kind of how I view that aspect of it let's see here you know what we only have two more i'll just do these 
Do you ever look at athletes in other sports and think that they could have potential if they ever did bodybuilding, meaning in classic or physique? Yes, I see it all the time. I see a lot of athletes in classic, especially, that I look at and think, man, if that guy put on 20 pounds, he would just be phenomenal. Like if you look at Chris Bumstead, imagine Chris Bumstead with 20 pounds of muscle on him. He's now like looks like a Dennis Wolf character. Like it's just a crazy, crazy physique. So I kind of I see it all the time, but they look great in their respective divisions. I mean, there's there's physique guys that have just crazy, crazy shape, but they look great in their respective divisions. So I can't really say, oh, you're you know you're wasting your talent because you're not. You're at the Olympia level in your division, so you're you've made the best of your physique. I'm not one to judge. I mean, it takes a lot to be an open bodybuilder. You got, there's a lot of things that go along with being an open bodybuilder, a lot of lifestyle choices, a lot of uh, things that you have to sacrifice to be this big. So yeah, I see those guys, but I also understand why they made the choice they made. So yeah, it, it's, a, but it's cool. It's very cool to see that physique when you know, you look at it and you're like, wow, you know, that would be something special. So there's definitely a lot of those guys. Nathan Caniff says, Diaz or Masvidal for the BMF belt? Also, what is the dosing going to look like in your SUPS? Uh, the dosing, like I said at the beginning of this whole podcast, will be clinical, so you don't have to worry about that. Everything we picked to go into our products was researched, and we picked clinical doses only. We did not actually went over on a couple things, but there's not one product in, there's not one ingredient in our products that we use less than you're supposed to use. I can say that with a guarantee. Um, as far as the BMF belt, I'm fucking torn. <laughs> I love Diaz, but Masvidal is tough as fuck. So I don't know. It's like, I'm almost like, I almost got one of these things where I'm like, I want Diaz to win but I think Masvidal is going to win. So I don't, I don't know. It's going to be a great fight, man. I can't wait for Saturday night. Anyways, listen guys, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for following the Q and A's. Please subscribe to the channel because these Q and A's are going to be done here. We're also going to be doing a lot of different other videos on this channel. So please subscribe to the hostile company channel and um, check us out also on Instagram at hostile subs. We also have a Facebook page. Check us out there. And just kind of keep up with everything. And also, if you go to the Hostile Sups Instagram page, you can uh, click the link and sign up for pre-orders. Make sure you do that. And uh, yeah, share with your friends, man. We'll talk to you guys soon. I hope you guys got a lot of information out of it. And uh, train hard. Stay fit.